Hello one and all, Mickey is surviving RNG now, where were we? Right, finishing the Q&A and showing you guys the little I've got done for the Geoscape. Amateurish author, the requirement your faction might have to do would be to respect the territory rights of the various creatures. Basically adding another cost to the next faction, the Petmaster faction, and I'm not sure, maybe. Honestly, the Petmaster faction is one of the least penalizing to join, in theory, because when you join them, you don't technically lose anything at all. Sure, your food requirement goes up, but it essentially doubles the number of units that can go on a mission. I think the balance will come in when I have to test and see how much impairs the outcome of a mission when a pet dies. That I think will be the deciding factor. And then being forced to sacrifice soldiers to make one or two stronger isn't worth it. Okay, so I'm not entirely sure if you're misunderstanding me or if you actually think that it's not worth sacrificing a soldier to unlock that core DNA skill tree. But as a quick recap, sacrificing a soldier doesn't simply make one or two stronger. When you're the mutant faction, all of your soldiers will have hidden perk trees, hidden core DNA. Initially, it will just be marked with question marks. As they level up, more and more of those will become available. And once they are available, and you do a research based on that skill tree, that core DNA, it will then be required that you sacrifice, based on the difficulty, a number of those soldiers that have that core DNA, thereby unlocking that core DNA, that skill tree, to everyone that has it. So for example, a really basic core DNA, like the rat tree, it'll be so common, say for example, 60% of your soldiers will actually have it, as well as having multiple other skill trees at random. Once the first soldier reaches the rank where that skill tree becomes available, it becomes visible, you can then do a research and then be required to sacrifice a number of soldiers that have that skill tree. Of course, it needs to be visible. They need to be of a certain rank to be able to see that they have it. Then everybody that has that core DNA, that skill tree, effectively 60% of your soldiers will be able to level up that skill tree. Of course, if they choose to. You can only level up in one core DNA skill tree at a time. So it won't just be a sacrifice for one or two soldiers. It'll be a sacrifice of one or two soldiers to unlock a perk tree for a large portion, a large percentage of the soldiers in your roster. I don't imagine that many people would go for the mutant faction, same with the Vampire Lord faction, unless the bonuses are among the strongest in the game. Well, the Mutant faction, as I said, I disagree with, but the Vampire faction, yeah, that is going to require balance. Even with that Vampire Lord, that one soldier, getting triple or quadruple the stats when he turns into a vampire, and all the other soldier stats getting halved, you're still going to be a deficit. So yes, it's going to require balance to make it more of an incentive to join them. But bear in mind, that faction in particular, the Undead, the Vampire Lord, they're the only faction where you're controlling essentially a boss unit, a leader unit. So that unit's power will have to be represented accordingly. Okay, and then the mech faction. The brain unit can be taken out of the body and put into a smaller unit for life support. Yes, logically that makes sense, but unless that life support unit was a late game tech that required a lot to build, it would defeat the purpose of the penalty of joining the mechs. As Scorpy said, it already doesn't sound like there's much of a penalty to join them. And then removing your convoy's power drain for having so many mech units by taking their brain out and putting it into life support can almost entirely remove that faction's penalty. So yeah, maybe it can be a late game tech, maybe it can be expensive, to research and build, but again, it'll depend on balance. And then the Psy faction, the parasites. Have them consume the host to either make food or generate more parasites. I like this idea. I really like it. You can have the requirements to grow more parasites, B, to sacrifice soldiers. And hell, why even limited soldiers? Why not prisoners as well? If you capture a prisoner, implant them with a parasite, have the parasite consume the prisoner, it then gives birth to another parasite. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I like that. You're encouraged to bring in more people just to solve them. Yeah, I, I really like that. That is really cool. Again, that sticks with the element of sacrifice. Granted, if they're prisoners, it's not much of a sacrifice to you, but technically, prisoners are a resource. Prisoners are potential soldiers that could join you, so yes, it is still a sacrifice. It's still resources you're consuming. So yeah, I absolutely like that. Very good idea. Why not allow it to be done to prisoners instead of soldiers? As I said, why not? Although this is in relation to the mutant faction, in that you could capture a prisoner, mutate them with a mutagen, and then sacrifice them based on their core DNA to unlock that core DNA skill tree. It will depend on balance, but I don't see why not. Bearing in mind that the core DNA skill tree needs to be visible and it'll only be visible based on that unit's rank. So capturing a low level enemy and giving them the mutagen will at best only reveal the most low tier core DNA skill trees like rat or bovine or something like that. But if you want to get the really high tier skill trees you need to either sacrifice a high level soldier that has that core DNA or capture a high level enemy. What defines high level in terms of an enemy I don't know. Again that will depend on implementing some sort of mechanic. Maybe like a long war style aliens have ranks that kind of thing but then after you give them the mutagen hope that they have a high level core DNA that you actually want 
And Mats, where's the xenophobes? Like, all those factions sound very interesting, but where's the human supremacists? If I can pronounce it, oh my god. Alright, so Mats, yeah, I had a long talk with you on the Discord about this, and before I answer, I think I'll read the other key points you said. Benefits conclude the classic human things adapt to everything really fast, and could they at least get something that you can't get anywhere else by joining any other faction? And also, what happened to make all of us organization resistance just fall apart? Can they randomly show up to help you? Alright, so, the human faction will not get powers. The human faction is base. It is, as you said, it's pure. If they're the supremacists, then they are pure. They don't get benefits. And that is the entire point. Not just the idea of the game, but also the gameplay mechanics themselves. If you want to be stubborn and stay pure from an idealist point of view, then you're welcome to do that. Don't join any other faction. If you want to increase difficulty, of which there will be difficulty settings, but much like Dark Souls and using shields, if you want to increase difficulty, don't use shields. This will be very much like that. If you want a high difficulty, don't join a faction. To give the humans their own unique benefits would defeat the entire point. Not just the idea of the game, but also the mechanics of the game. They will absolutely not get any kind of superpowers that the other factions don't have access to. But having said that, like I mentioned in last video, the humans do technically get a benefit. They're the only faction that can use all the other tech and research possibilities from all the other factions. But as I said in that video, the problem is it will take them a lot of work to do it. A lot of captures, a lot of resources, a lot of research, just to get one tech and potentially one perk from a different faction just for one soldier. So it's not like they don't have their benefits, but I do want to enforce playing purely as humans is hard mode. And what happened to all of Earth's organized resistance? As mentioned earlier, with so much of the population just phasing out of existence and going somewhere else to another Earth, and with more people phasing in, and with so many different kind of aliens and factions phasing in as well, that can quite easily break down society. I mean, if you look at XCOM 2, that's just one faction. Just one faction. And the humans are gone. I mean, you say, oh, but you know, the resistance is there. Are they really? Are they? How much do they actually help? All that happens is you go to save them during terror missions. That doesn't feel like helping. But as I said earlier again, there are neutral camps that you can go to to trade, to gain more soldiers, that kind of thing. They are there and if you want to stay human, it would be a good idea to protect them and stop the major factions from destroying them because that's going to be your main source of soldiers. And before anybody asks what you're going to do when all those factions are gone, A, when you're low on soldiers, the likelihood of finding random soldiers just wandering around the geoscape, that will increase just to help you out a little bit. And B, if you do get that boned where there are no more neutral camps, then maybe it's time that you actually consider joining one of the factions. That is the entire premise of the game. If you can't make it out on your own, then you need to submit to somebody bigger than you and join them. Will there be an air game? As much as I mocked XCOM 2 for not having an air game, functionally it actually makes less sense for there to be an air game here. You don't have air bases. You don't have a giant flying airship. That itself also has room for fighters. You don't have that. Technically, I do want to allow finding and repairing and maintaining things like helicopters, because they can fit onto a convoy like a flatbed truck, and maybe they can provide air support in missions at the cost of missiles and stuff like that, only ammo that helicopters can use. But in terms of actual air game, I don't know how to implement it, and also have it work with the convoy mechanic. Not to mention it's another gameplay element that I actually have to code and work it out to do. Sub-factions, rebels against the aliens. Now this won't be the last time I talk about sub-factions because other people have asked. Rebels against the aliens. Now, the human base is either bandit or neutral. They will fight back against the aliens, but they will also inevitably get overwhelmed. They can provide a source of new soldiers and tech. Tech, not sure about, but soldiers, yeah, definitely. As I said, with the neutral camps, you can hire new soldiers there. And with the bandit camps, there's no reason why you can't catch people and convert them. But these human camps Camps, bandit or neutral, they won't act as a faction. The closest description I can give them is like the bandit camps in Total War in the early game. They're there just as road bumps in the early game before the factions take over. And then, moving on to the Discord, Kingdom Cody, also known as Amateurish Author. If a soldier has lots of perch trees, then it might be best if the perch trees themselves were short, as in shorter than XCOM 2. It depends. The soldier's class perch tree will be pretty much like it's in Long War. So, that many tiers with that many options. That's pretty much what I'm going for. The extra perch trees, like Sion mutations or pets, it's really going to depend. Like Psy, for example, there might only be one Psy tree, in which case it would need to be a big Psy tree comparable to a soldier class. Whereas mutations, on the other hand, there are lots of mutation trees, which means they will likely be much smaller. And animals, another good example, there'll be lots of different animals, which means that their perk trees will also be smaller, like, I don't know, three or four tiers with two options in each tier, that kind of thing. So yeah, it would depend. The Chrysalid from Accounting. I'm sorry, buddy, I don't know who you are on YouTube. I, I bet you're somebody on YouTube, but... <laughs> 
So many people use so many different names, I don't remember who's who. Tie some perk trees to medals. Hell no! Absolutely no! People have asked as well in my Long War campaign that I've got, the XMW Long War AI Pets campaign. Yeah, great name, Mickey. Always, I always think of such great names. Give perks or stat increases based on the medals they get. I don't want to do that because it encourages snowballing. It encourages the strong to get stronger and I really don't want to do that. Having said that, there may be requirements for perks. For example, in Long War, to get the Psy Rift ability, you need to mine control and ethereal. There may be requirements for certain high level perks that do need to be accomplished to unlock that perk. But again, that is for much later in the development of the game. Then Crimson, Rat Folk or Skaven like race that acts like most classic XCOM soldiers. All right, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the problem with this kind of sub faction is why? How do they fit into the style of the game, the story of the game and the gameplay mechanics? What purpose do they serve? What gameplay element do they fill? Because as I mentioned, there are technically sub factions ish like neutral human camps or bandit camps and the purpose they serve the neutral camps to trade with and get soldiers and also if you're going to stay human you need to protect them because they're a resource for you for more soldiers and the bandit camps for items and weapons and maybe even tech but only in the early game before they get wiped out by enemy factions that's the purpose of those neutral human and bandit camps but having like a rat folk or skaven like race i don't entirely understand the purpose of them and not to mention it'd be more work It'd be so much more work. I mean, if you can think of a good reason why they would exist, bear in mind they'd be the only unique sub-faction in the game, they would feel out of place. If I was going to implement them, I'd need to implement a bunch of other sub-factions just for them not to feel out of place. Jack Sharpton. I feel up to the stealth error is fun and awesome. It needs to be something like on your turn if you get spotted, unless you end the turn. If you somehow deal with them, you can avoid alerting the enemy, or firing off a loud weapon will get you spotted. Okay, well let me cover this first. Yes, the stealth mechanic will be much, much more forgiving than some something like XCOM 2 or Phantom Doctrine. If a soldier spots you, only that soldier and a soldier's in close proximity to that one soldier will be alerted. At that point, you will have until the end of your turn to either do one of two things, slightly kill or knock out that soldier and the soldiers he alerted nearby, or use loud weapons and kill or knock out all of the enemies on the map. Yes, there will be a sound system in the game. How that will be visualized, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe while you're in stealth and you've got weapons selected, there could be a circle around the soldier indicating how far the noise will carry. But yes, I want stealth to be forgiven. Bearing in mind, if more than one or two soldiers on the map go missing and don't report, those remaining will call for reinforcements. Maybe first they'll go to investigate, but either way there will be reinforcements coming. And then when they arrive and realize that nobody's responding, then come the heavy reinforcements. Also, if you reload a gun with a magazine that still has ammo, it should keep track of that ammo. No! Why? That sounds horrible! Why would you do that? You're essentially saying the level of realism of reloading a gun needs to be that of a military simulator. God no! Why would you do that? Although, I actually changed my mind since the last video I made, and I was actually thinking the ammo system was something like Dead State, where ammo is just a pile of bullets, and when you reload your gun, that amount of bullets gets used up and gets put into the gun. That, I think, will keep it simple. And then if you want to throw a few magazines over, you set the ammo, you set the amount that you want to throw, and then when you throw it, the model or the sprite will just look like a magazine of ammo. Then for a base defense, your troopers can slowly bleed in as they were off on patrol. Yeah, that's a good idea. Again, I don't know how I'll fully handle base defense where you could have like upwards of 60 soldiers. What would prevent those soldiers from all being there? Because in terms of game engine, the game engine just might crash. Maybe, I'm not sure. But in terms of balance, I can tell you right now that'd be a pain to balance. So I don't know how to limit the number of soldiers in a base defense. I mean, how was it in OG XCOM? I think there you had every single soldier that was at the base. Whereas compared to new XCOM and XCOM 2, you have like a squad of soldiers with maybe like reinforcements. So I don't know how I'd limit that. Or more importantly, I don't know the story reason for why that would be limited. There's a very key distinction there. Yes, the number of soldiers you need to have on a base defense should be limited for the purposes of balance. The question is, how do I express that notion to the player without making them feel frustrated? I want to ask that is it possible to have say different people or creatures, if the case may be from other factions in your own, if you're neutral, and if so, will they be eliminated if they are not part of the faction you join? Yes, any unit or tech or perk tree will be destroyed when you join a faction that doesn't like the tech or unit or perk from another faction. Remember, you're submitting to them, their rules. If they think they're superior or if they're disgusted by whatever tech that belongs to an enemy faction, one of those key rules will be you destroy everything that belongs to them. You're not using their crap. It's disgusting, you will not touch it. But yeah, that would be story reason why that would happen. Kingdom Cody, if the end game for the nature factions isn't dinosaurs, I'll be sorely disappointed. And also dragons, you mentioned later. Alright, so when it comes to the next faction,
faction, I was actually thinking, have the nature faction be purely alien creatures? Sure, have earth creatures on the map, maybe, I don't know. It will depend on the work that's required. But have the nature faction be purely alien creatures. So why not have dinosaur looking alien creatures? Why not have dragon looking alien creatures? This is one of those situations where it sounds cool, so why not implement it? You can bend the story around the idea. If they're aliens, then why do they need to look like anything on our planet? Any cool idea for a creature, why not? As long as it fits the gameplay, then why the hell not? So yeah, I'm all for that. The Chrisid from Accounting. Will we be able to set up multiple bases or have any way of establishing our own sustainable territory? Okay, now this is a very good question. I've been thinking about this. So first question, having multiple bases. I think the short answer is going to be no. I don't think you're ever going to be able to have multiple bases. Now in terms of establishing territory, how that will function. If you join a faction, if you want to help expand that faction's territory, which would be good for you if you join them, to build whatever structure or tech on the map to expand that faction's reach. That'll also be how those factions themselves work. And to a degree, if you're human, that's technically also how it will work. If you stay human, you can build things like watchtowers and man like, I don't know, one or two soldiers. What happens if an enemy attacks it? I don't know. Maybe that soldier automatically moves towards your convoy and you can only slightly alter the course it takes. So you can't move it away from the convoy, but you can move it around obstacles. So it has to always be moving towards the convoy to regroup. But those watchtowers, all they'll do is give you vision of the map. If you're human, you don't technically have a faction color. And this, this I really like. I know, Matt, I think you had an issue with this, but the idea will be with the humans not having a faction color, at first it will feel like they don't own territory. But in actual fact, you'll realize as you go from the early game to the late game, the human's territory is neutral ground. That's their territory. Their territory is when no other faction is occupying ground. That's theirs. It's essentially Earth. That's how the human faction works. So when you push back an enemy faction, taking out a key region, a watchtower, whatever, whatever the mission type would be, and they lose ground, you essentially gain ground. Ideally, you'd also want to place down a watchtower to have vision, but that's how you gain ground, by taking the territory from the enemy, any one of the enemy factions, destroying whatever building or tech whatever they've got that expands their reach, and that will then in turn give it back to you. Of course, assuming you stay human. Descriptor, is it gonna be possible to betray the faction you join? Betray, no, because that would imply control. You don't have control or choice of the path, the kind of ideology of your soldiers when you join an enemy faction. You become part of them, so to betray them would kind of defeat that point. Now, whether you could leave that faction at some point, maybe, it will depend. As mentioned in the previous video, if it exists, it will be definitely a late game tech. It will leave your faction weakened, that kind of thing. It will be something that comes at a very big cost. The Chrysalid from Accounting. Will there be an animation in which you can pet your pet? Yes! <laughs> Honestly, for that kind of thing, what I could simply do is on the squad loadout screen, if they have a pet, their idle animation will change based on what pet they've got, which would also include occasionally and at random leaning down and stroking and petting their pet. So yes, I suppose. Jack Sharperton. So what would be the victory condition? Okay, very good question. And I don't entirely know the answer to it. It will depend. It's going to depend on balance. But the victory condition can be one of several things I have in mind. When you start a campaign, you could choose your victory condition based on how long you want the campaign to go. You can have one victory condition be occupy a certain percentage of the map, either as a faction or as humans. Of course, it won't apply in the early game. Or you can have a faction be destroy all the HQ of every major faction. Or if you only want to play a short campaign, you can have the victory condition be destroy only the HQ of one faction, a random faction or one faction in particular you could target. At the start of the campaign, you could pick destroy the HQ of this faction, victory achieved. At which point, when that's accomplished, you could choose, okay, end the campaign here or continue playing. So yeah, I do want those kind of options to be implemented. And then diplomacy, yeah. <laughs> Well, I've got highlighted here, diplomacy. So, as I mentioned earlier, hard no, hard pass, definitely no, absolutely not. If you take the idea of this game, essentially Battle Brothers Geoscape, XCOM Battlescape, with a survival type feel to it, diplomacy does not fit into that at all. I don't even want it there. I don't want it to be an option. I don't want kind of total war politics and religion in my game. I don't want it at all. Survival is key. If you can't survive on your own, then submit to a bigger faction for their protection and their power. Then, not fashion. <laughs> Ransom or release to improve relations. Again, that ties into diplomacy. No diplomacy whatsoever. And as for releasing prisoners back to a faction for something, like a trade or something, I'm not sure about that. The question is, why would you do that? If you've got a prisoner, they are a resource. You can autopsy them. You can break them down for parts. Maybe they've got tech that's tied into their body or something. Essentially, give them back to a faction doesn't really serve much purpose in terms of the gameplay. It doesn't fit the style of the game. FO Frosty. <laughs> Again, diplomacy 
diplomacy. You can see in the Discord, people were talking about diplomacy at this point. Gotta say, hard no. And instead of morale and fatigue, have a mental health system. And yeah, somebody mentioned this earlier, like RimWorld. And as I mentioned then, it really, really wouldn't fit into the game. The game is very combat heavy. It's not a settlement or colony management game. And having people break during a mission because of something that happened on the battlescape, like two people had an argument, and now that person is more mentally vulnerable. Oh my God, that's frustrating in RimWorld, where combat is not the major part of the game. Much less in a game where combat is the main part of the game. Then Brain 322. You gather resources from missions only. Not a fan of that. I don't want the missions to become grindy. The idea was on the Geoscape you gather boring resources. And boring resources I mean like food, wood, scrap, that kind of thing. Whereas on the missions you gather more specialised resources like weapons, ammo, maybe high level scrap like electronic scrap or something like that. High level power sources. Basically on missions you gather items whereas on the Geoscape you gather resources. Not fascist. Pre-generated maps with random starting points for each faction. Yeah, pretty much. The idea I have in mind for the Geoscape, which I'll show you guys in a second, if I can get the mapping tool, the tile set system in Godot, to function exactly how I want it to, then creating a world map will be incredibly, incredibly easy. I was actually thinking, not only could I then use that system to randomly generate a map based on a few parameters, but I could also say, take the topographic view of a country, including things like their metropolitan areas, and then use that for a basis to, over the course of a day, create a map based on real world countries. As I said, if the tile system can work as I intend it to, then it'd be very, very easy to do. So yeah, I could have both pre-generated maps that you could choose based on the country you want to start in, the map you want to play on, the Geoscape map, and both have randomly generated maps, like in Battle Brothers, where the Geoscape map is completely random. Well, for the most part, random. Brain 322, randomly generated maps, use bits of small terrain to make maps. So I cover the Geoscape, how the Battlescape will work is, as I mentioned, kind of similar to how XCOM 2 does it, where depending on the biome, it will pick what's called a plot of of land and that land will have locations where points of interest can be placed down and then it will pick at random points of interest to plonk down in those slots to fill out the map and then the loot and the condition of those points of interest will then be generated at random as well. Of course those are for more built up areas if it's more of a rural area like a woods or something it can be almost entirely randomly generated but yeah that kind of map generation for Battlescape and then a black market system well I mean there will be trading as I mentioned with neutral camps so in terms of a black market I don't know how that would really function, especially if you compare it to XCOM's grey market, when you're trading, the stuff you're trading just disappears. You say, okay, I'll sell six mutant corpses for, I don't know, 80 bucks, mutant corpses disappear, 80 bucks magically appears. You will actually need to travel to a location to trade. I think actually that's how it is in XCOM 2. You have to go to a black market to trade, don't you? So in that sense, yes, it will be similar. You have to go to a neutral camp to trade. Jack Sharpton, do we have names for some of the factions or even settled on a name for the game itself? No and no. I don't have names for any of the factions, any at all, I don't even have any in mind, so knock yourself out. <laughs> And as for the name of the game, I like the idea of Shattered Earth, but as I mentioned, in an ideal world, the name of this game will cover the survival elements, the geoscape elements, the factions, the sacrificing, and the turn-based tactics. Ideally, a name would encompass all those elements of the game. If you can think of something that covers all of those topics, then please tell me. Jack again, imagine different minor factions. Again, the problem is, A, that's a lot of work to implement, and B, what purpose would they serve? These minor factions would just get overrun by the major factions as you progress into the mid-game, which functionally is identical to how the neutral camps and bandit camps work. So this would be an example of overlapping gameplay. And then Shivel, important question. Are you going to be an Epic Store exclusive? No, but I will have an in-game shop where you can buy one and only one item that is a clothing item for your soldiers that is a t-shirt that says, I help support this game. And that's it. That is the one item I will have in my in-game shop. And a lot of other people have added in the Discord, oh, I want to be able to buy a t-shirt that's got like a, a chrysalid on it or an XCOM rookie on it, that kind of thing. No, all of those kind of t-shirts, if I add them, which I don't know if I will, because that's just more and more time being wasted for cosmetics. If I add them, they won't be paid for. That kind of defeats the point of that kind of mock in-game shop. And then lastly, which is just a perfect segue, Jack Sharpton. So if I may ask, just what is the status of this at the moment? Well, buddy, that leads me on nicely. I'm actually going to make a cut here because I need to finish the work that I'm doing on the game to show the basic geoscape. Very, very basic. So I'll be back in a second. Okay, so this is what I have got done so far. Granted, it doesn't exactly look a lot, but bear in mind, everything you're seeing here, every action that I'm doing, that's all coded. I've got camera control, I've got zoom, I've got sliding camera when you put your mouse to the edge of the screen when you hold down control. There is a basic UI down here. I should really start off with this, full disclosure. I didn't work out how to do any of this, right? I learned this from a YouTuber who was basically doing a tutorial guide on how to do a kind of RTS game. That channel and the link will be both in the description and on the screen right now. 
down, but hence why you've got this kind of stock UI down here. And when you click on units, they appear down here. And ignore their health bar. This was just testing doing RNG. So when the map loads, they have a random amount of health. And also you can drag and select or deselect or shift and select, selecting the opposite one or deselect via the UI. All really good stuff. That guide was great. I mean, granted it was an intermediate guide. It has it in the title of the videos. So I was really stupid doing it. I wasted a huge amount of time trying to solve problems simply because I'm not experienced enough to follow a tutorial guide that is intermediate, but I did it anyway. But other than that, we've got pathfinding. That works great. Of course, you only have one convoy on the map, so let's just get rid of you, move you down there, and we'll use you. There you go. So we do have pathfinding. So that works. Granted, it's not very accurate about where it clicks. I've been noticing that. That's something I'd have to figure out. I don't really know why, but there is proper pathfinding. So for example, if I click there, Go all the way around and there you go. Now the problems that I had so far, as you can see behind here, this zone is the pathfinding zone, is as it is very clear, the pathfinding is done manually. So for example, I've extended an area off here just to show you can just drive into the water and also yeah that's the, the end of the map here. So the kind of map generation I'm looking for, yes random generation will be nice, but initially if I just close this down and hide the pathing like that, is currently I'm using the tile sets. So I've created a tile set for terrain and a tile set for objects that go on the terrain. Roads, boulders, Forest, that kind of thing. Now, unfortunately, tile sets can be used to create solid objects if you're controlling an entity directly. But when you're using pathfinding, as you can see, pathfinding does need to get done manually. So I don't know how to update it automatically yet. I'd really want a tile set kind of map generation where the pathfinding kind of auto generates around the map. And also these rocks and roads and forests and stuff like that, they don't slow you down, speed you up. Now, again, I know how to do that, but it won't be automatic. It won't be tied to the tile generation. So I can create zones manually for where the roads are and have it code so that while on the road, the speed of the unit on the road gets increased, maybe by a percent, maybe by a value, haven't we decided. And the same, of course, can apply for enemy units. And likewise, on rocks or forests, you get slowed down. As I said, I know how to do this, but I don't know how to make it automatic. I don't know how to tie it to the tile sets I've got here. So guys, that is it, really. That is what I've got done. What the plan I think is going to be from now on, I can't do these videos every two weeks. I can't. I just, I, I can't spend the time doing them. It took so long to do this. As you can see, this is the coding for the unit and down here is the previous coding I had for manual control of the unit. We got the coding for the geoscape. Again as I said this is almost entirely identical to the tutorial guide that I was following and then the coding for the camera which was a massive pain in the ass as well as scripts for a couple of other things that aren't really being used. I was messing about with trying to code objects in the map to slow something down. Yes when you go at speed 500 you do indeed say we. So what the plan is going to be instead of every two weeks I'm going to say every month so that will be let's just stick with the working title of Shattered Earth. It'll be XCOM, then the following week Shattered Earth, then XCOM, then nothing, then XCOM, then Shattered Earth. Because as I said, I, I can't do this every two weeks. I don't have the time to make a video and also make proper progress that is worth showing every two weeks. So it will be once a month. But the next episode, what I'm going to do is create an extensive list of mechanics that I need to learn how to do. That if I can do all of them, then I know that I can actually make the game in theory. And this list is going to range from, as you can see, pathfinding to full map generation where terrain objects actually slow down units, to separate and combining units, to transferring information via libraries from, say, the geoscape to the battlescape. Then, of course, moving on to the battlescape, blah, blah, blah. There's a huge list. I'll show everything that I've come up with in the next episode, which will be in a month's time. But in the meantime, guys, if you have questions, if you have ideas, let me know in the comments below or on the channel in the Discord. I'll do a follow-up QA session in the next video, and I'll do that with every video that I make, answering any questions that you have or responding to any ideas that you guys have got. But I guess in the meantime, guys, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to close range that like button, type in that machine in the comments below and let anybody else know if they've enjoyed the video as well. It really helps out the channel and I'll see you guys back next time for more very, very slow development of working title Shattered Earth. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.